According to the New England Journal of Medicine, over 20,000 Americans die every year from uncontrolled bleeding. In the medical community, this is referred to as hemorrhaging or even hypovolemic shock. Worldwide, that accounts for over 2 million deaths every year, three quarters of which are caused by traumatic injuries. The reason this applies to everybody is because we're all human. Uh, injuries and accidents do happen frequently, even when you're not expecting it. And I feel everybody should be trained uh, in case you do find yourself in an emergent situation. The human body has about five to six liters of blood. And with your heart circulating four to five quarts of blood every minute, that means a person can bleed out in just under five minutes. I was a medic in the Army for about four years. Uh, I had a lot of formal training with first aid training to include the tourniquet. And I feel it's very important. It's a very easy technique. It's very quick, and I believe it's very effective. Today, I want to go over a brief history of the tourniquet throughout the years. I'll uh, go over uh, some basic human anatomy for how the tourniquet applies to save a life. And we'll go over the proper technique for using a tourniquet. Uh, the first documented evidence, this is uh, in the Military Medical Journal, published back in 2006, uh, was by a Surgeon General uh, in 1517. His name was Hans van Gerdsdorp. And he used the tourniquet for amputation surgery. He, uh, he didn't believe uh, to use the tourniquet as a way of preventing blood loss. This was at the time where bloodletting was still very common. And so he actually used the tourniquet to help him with his amputation surgeries in a means to dull the pain or he just eliminate the pain altogether while he's hacking off limbs. And a lot of the older pictures you see in the slides, that will be from his actual diary back in the 1500s. And the tourniquet's used throughout history in various wars. Until uh, we get to the Civil War, we see Confederate and Union sides both using the tourniquet and they're actually issuing it to their soldiers. Now, the use of the tourniquet has been debated a lot throughout the half millennia, uh, just because it can cause gangrene, as we saw in the Civil War. It takes a lot of time for the litter bearers to get the casualties to the hospital. And again, once a gangrene sets in, they just basically had to amputate the limb, which is pretty gruesome. Then during World War I, uh, we saw multiple countries starting to issue the tourniquet to their soldiers, but again, it was up to a high debate as to whether they were effective, simply because it would cause limb loss where they didn't amputate the leg or the arm, they just kept it intact, but it would remain non-functional. And at that time, the mentality was if you didn't have an operating arm or leg, you were considered an invalid. And that was just a thinking at that time. But uh, during this time, during these wars, we saw the tourniquet uh, develop rapidly. Uh, when it was first developed, it was a five to 10 pound weight that would screw onto the tourniquet itself, which obviously added the weight to carrying the patient. Sometimes it was made out of pure metal, uh, with lead even. And of course, you don't want 10 pounds of lead being pressed onto an open wound. Uh, it causes a lot of problems. So uh, with that being said, uh, even though the debate is still raging, we'll just go ahead and we'll hop into the anatomy of the tourniquet. Uh, this mainly applies to your arms, legs, even your fingers and toes. Uh, you don't want to be applying it to your neck, of course, uh, anywhere on majorly on the body. That would just cause some harm. Now, the reason we do the legs and arms is just because there's just the main arterial vessels that we see. They're pretty easy to compress. Uh, normally, when you see hemorrhaging, uh, you have various types of bleedings. With arterial bleeding, it's going to be bright red. It's going to be spouting, basically, almost like a shooting fountain. That's because the heart is pumping the blood out of the vessel, causing it to shoot out like a squirt gun. Uh, with venous bleeding, you'll see it will be a lot darker, it'll be oozing. Both cases, you, you can hemorrhage out, but it's more common with arterial bleeding. Uh, capillary bleeding is included as well, but it's very rare for someone to bleed out from capillary bleeding, unless they have a severe clotting disorder. I also wanted to include fractures. Uh, the reason fractures are important is because when someone has a fracture in their arm or leg, it can cause bone fragments that can actually slice through your artery, uh, it's pretty common to see it happen, especially with femur fractures. Uh, you always want to make sure you're looking for any bleeding. And that's just basically some uh, basic anatomy, now which we'll talk about how to apply the tourniquet. This is actually from the field guide I pulled that we use to train the soldiers in the army. And of course, you don't need an actual standard tourniquet, you can just use material. And there's some basic, uh, basic rules that we follow. I uh, just want to use a material that's at least two inches wide. Uh, the material should be strong and pliable, flexible. Uh, oftentimes you can cut off a shirt or a sleeve 
and use that as a means to wrap around an extremity. In the worst case scenario, you can also do body taping where you would take the limb to another limb with the legs to themselves or the fingers to themselves. That's a way to stabilize the bleeding. We also talk about pulses when it comes to tourniquets. Uh, there's two main types of the one in the wrist, the radial pulses, and the pedal pulses in the feet. Once you apply the tourniquet, you want the pulse to be absent. Uh, you'll check for it. And with an absent pulse, you will see, of course, that your tourniquet is effective. If you're still seeing a pulse or if you're still seeing some bleeding, that's pretty common, and you just want to apply a second tourniquet uh, above the site that you apply it to. Also, when applying tourniquets uh, for the site, that the effective site where it's bleeding, you want to make sure at least two to four inches above it. Uh, you obviously want to tape it down, of course, make sure it is secure. Uh, if you don't have any tape or securing materials, if the person is still conscious, they can hold on to the handle of the tourniquet. Uh, keep it tight, of course. And it's pretty important. Uh, this in case you're out in the woods, you don't have cell phone service, you can't call the EMTs. Just go ahead and apply that tourniquet. It gives you a lot of extra time. You can over that five minutes. All right. And that is the second tourniquet that I was talking about earlier. Pretty effective, of course. And those are the actual combat tourniquets, but those are rarely issued. You can buy them uh, in case you, you like to hike a lot or go camping. I feel it's pretty important. All right. So, now that we've talked about tourniquets, uh, we've got a little bit of the basic history, the basic anatomy, and of course, uh, how to properly apply a tourniquet. Uh, I just want to hit home about how quickly someone can bleed out. It only takes five minutes for a person to bleed out, which is actually shorter than the amount of time that this speech actually took. Thank you for your time.